Welcome to the presentation from Module 3 for Nursing 150. This discussion will um, go into hematologic disorders, which are which typically refers to disorders of the blood and blood products. We will cover anemias, leukemia, um, and lymphoma in this presentation. The hematologic system um, contains the red blood cells. Red blood cells are important because they carry oxygen to all the tissues of the body. Without sufficient amount of red blood cells circulating in the body, the body, some of the body's tissues will not have adequate oxygen, and that will um, cause a problem in the, in the total body health if there's not enough oxygen to supply to all the tissues. And we'll discuss what those signs and symptoms look like. This is just a review of the different types of blood cells that are required for the body to maintain health. We've already talked some, and when we talked about the immune system, about what the leukocytes do, or the white blood cells. The erythrocytes, also known as the red blood cells, have hemoglobin on them, and that is what binds to the oxygen and delivers oxygen to the tissues. Platelets are the other piece of the blood component. They help to clot the blood. Um, and this, this slide here shows you all the typical, common, um, normal values for these cells, each of these cells. So the red blood cells, typically, typically 4 to 7 million, they live for about eight, 80 to 120 days. Um, leukocytes, typically 5,000 to 10,000 is what the typical norm is for those. And then your platelets, 150,000 to 400,000. Those three cells, you should, um, you should have some idea of what their normal values are. And remember, these cells are all started um, and, and grow from the bone marrow. So we have to have a normally functioning, functioning bone marrow in order to have the correct normal number of these cells as well. These are just topics uh, that you will do in your assessment of a patient to determine whether you see any signs or symptoms of anemia or some deficient and deficiency in any of those cells. For instance, the skin. Someone who doesn't have enough uh, red blood cells perhaps could be pale, kind of ashen looking. Um, respiratory wise, they might uh, be a little short of breath with activity due to the inability um, to get enough oxygen to all the tissues with exercise. Cardiovascular wise, a patient who is anemic could possibly um, have a lower blood pressure because they have lower circulating volume. This would also make them tachycardic. Uh, the tachycardia would be because the heart is trying to pump faster to get enough oxygen to the tissue, so it's trying to run the blood through the heart quicker so that it can get, um, so it can meet the oxygen demands of the tissues. There are some medications that could um, inhibit the production of some red blood cells or white blood cells. You would also look to see if anybody's on any blood thinners uh, because that would decrease, it could potentially affect their platelets. Assessment of their diet is important because um, red blood cells, for instance, require enough adequate amount of B12 and iron and folic acid in the diet. B12, iron, and folic acid all take a part in the production of a normal functioning red blood cell. Without adequate amounts of these in the diet, the patient could be, could um, result, could be an anemia, and some of those anemias we'll talk about. Review the assessment of the hematologic system in your Silvestri or your Iggy book um, to make sure you have an understanding of what a patient, what questions you would ask of your patient and things you would need to know. These are diagnostic assessment of a patient to determine if they have a hematologic disorder. Um, of course, the CBC with diff is something that's going to give us a lot of information about um, a patient's hematologic status. It's gonna give us a red blood cell count, a white blood cell count, and a platelet count. The differential will tell us exactly how many um, 
white blood cells that will differentiate them out into each specific type of white blood cell. It will also tell us the hemoglobin and hematocrit. We will need to know the hemoglobin level so we know the oxygen binding capability of the, the body so that we know if it's got enough hemoglobin in order to carry the oxygen to the tissues. Hematocrit is the number of cells in the in the blood in, in relation to the amount of plasma. So again, it kind of gives us a picture if the patient has enough um, red blood cells to carry oxygen to the tissues. Other labs we might do um, in order to investigate further regarding a um, suspicion of an anemia, um, we might do some iron, to iron levels, um, we might do some B12 levels to help us further um, investigate why somebody might not have enough red blood cells. Folic acid level is something else we could do as well. Biopsy, um, that could mean that we would do a bone marrow biopsy if we cannot figure out why somebody is chronically anemic. So in other words, they if they're chronically have low red blood cells and we can't find any other source, uh, we can't find any problems with their medicine. We might check the if we can biopsy if, uh, some tissue from the bone marrow to determine whether there's something um, wrong in the bone marrow where the patient is not able to produce uh, the right amount of blood cells. So it helps us to further um, differentiate what's going on with the patient, which is along the lines here of the bone marrow aspiration. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next slide, the bone marrow aspiration. PET scans are often used in diagnosis of cancers, um, so it could potentially be used here in this situation. It's, it stands for a positive emission tomography. It's a type of imaging. Um, it uses a radioactive drug to show activity of this, um, the organs. Just gives us an idea how the tissues and organs are functioning, um, typically used to reveal conditions like cancers and heart disease and brain disorders usually. This is a picture of how a bone marrow aspiration um, or biopsy is done. Uh, usually they will um, numb the area, they will topically numb the patient. Um, and then they insert a needle to where they can aspirate um, the content of the bone marrow into a syringe and then they can um, look at it under a microscope to determine it, whether the stem cells of the, um, the blood components um, are functioning properly. So the bone marrow biopsy, the, aspir the aspiration just um, refers to pulling it out and then the biopsy is where it's looked at under the microscope evaluates the patient's hematologic status when other tests show abnormal findings um, that indicate that something may be wrong in the blood cell production and, and, mat and maturation of them. So you have, as a nurse, we have to get a signed informed consent for this procedure, make sure they understand what's going to go on. A physician or advanced practice nurse will do this. Um, and just make sure that the patient knows it is a little bit uncomfortable um, and it, but it's a really quick procedure, uh, but it does cause a little bit of discomfort. They do try to numb the area as best they can in order to decrease the discomfort. Um, you have to prep your patient for that, explain the procedure. Um, you'll stay with them and kind of guide them and tell them what's going on during the procedure. Usually a friend or family member can also be um, present um, if they choose to have somebody with them. They typically have like a brief sensation of uh, like a painful pulling. It's when they aspirate it out, they'll feel that a little bit. Um, it'll just help the patient um, lay on their side and get them prepped and everything help get them prepped. Uh, procedure lasts about five to 15 minutes. Like I said, it's pretty quick. Um, sometimes they'll give them a little sedation if it's somebody that's really, really nervous about it, like a little Valium or something like that to kind of calm them down if needed. Um, they swab the site, disinfect it, get their, get their aspiration, um, and then uh, they will uh, put a dressing over the site. And uh, it's a job as a nurse for follow-up care to monitor that site for any bleeding.
Um, make sure the dressing is dry and clean and intact, just like other um, wounds that we take care of. They might need a little bit of um, an analgesic, maybe a Tylenol, maybe um, an ibuprofen for any pain and just give them some ice packs. Um, you're going to watch the site every two hours for the first 24 hours for bleeding, excessive bruising or anything like that. They should not have, um, they should limit their activity for the first 24 to 48 hours after the procedure. No contact sports um, that might kind of even further injure that site. Uh, these slides are just in here for you to check your learning, try to answer the question, and then check your answers in the comment section. Okay, this is just some sign uh, definitions of anemia. Um, it's typically defined as a number, a reduction in the number of red blood cells, the amount of hemoglobin or hematocrit in the blood. Um, it is a known to be a clinical sign. is not a specific disease. It's usually a result of another disease. Um, it typically can be caused by um, an increased destruction of the red blood cells decreased production or from blood loss. We'll talk about each of these anemia specifically in the next slides. These are signs and symptoms of um, anemia and we'll kind of talk, we've already kind of uh, talked about them a little bit but this is part of that assessment that we were talking about as far as each body system, what it would look like if an anemic patient. Um, fatigue, low blood pressure, rapid heart rate, uh, um, not a, the intestine, intestinal wall might have a um, change in their stool color, especially if they're bleeding. Um, if the anemia is caused by a GI bleed, that would cause some dark, tarry stools um, or some actually some blood, obvious blood in the stool. They're weak, they're short of breath, they're pale, cold, generally just don't feel as well because they're not getting enough oxygen to the tissues. So just a visual to kind of, um, so you can kind of visualize what it would look like as far as an anemic patient. As you can see here, um, there's a lot of red blood cells floating around and in here the number has decreased. So there's um, not enough oxygen being carried to the tissues. Iron deficiency anemia is the most common anemia worldwide. Um, it's typically related to a diet that's deficient in iron. Um, if it's somebody who perhaps is a vegan, sometimes they struggle with getting enough iron. Um, and it also can occur with chronic alcoholism. If somebody um, drinks a lot of alcohol all day long, usually, typically their diet is deficient and they don't absorb iron as well that they do take in, which also is related to like a malabsorption syndrome. Malabsorption syndrome just means they don't absorb it from their diet and for whatever reason. Partial gastrectomy means that if somebody has had a portion of their stomach removed, um, and that includes the people who are getting lap bands and um, gastric bypass surgery, that could affect their absorption of iron from their diet and cause uh, an iron deficiency anemia. Um, it also occurs during periods of rapid metabolism, such as adolescence or pregnancy. Um, sometimes severe infections and injury can cause a iron deficient anemia as well. This slide just shows uh, that typically patients should have two to six grams of iron, depending on their size. And typically, it can be managed with just increasing iron in the diet or iron from um, sources, so, you know, like supplements. Treatment for iron deficiency anemia um, is going to be education. Uh, just they might just need to get an iron supplement and increase their oral intake from food sources. You need to think about what those food sources might be. Those are typically red organ or meat, <clears throat> such as liver is very high in iron. Um, red meats are high in iron. Egg yolks are extremely high in iron. Kidney beans, leafy vegetables, and raisins are another source of iron. So you need to educate your patient um, what food sources they need to go to in order to increase their dietary intake of iron. And then if they were put on supplements, you need to teach the patient to take their supplements um, 
between meals for better absorption and to reduce any um, GI upset. Um, sometimes they can be given IV iron supplements. If their iron is very, very, very low, they can actually be given IV. Um, the other thing is um, sometimes they've, it's been shown if the patient takes an iron supplement with a vitamin C, um, like a, some kind of vitamin C source, like an orange juice, there tends to be a better absorption of it as well. Um, iron deficiency anemia causes um, a poor production of red blood cells because they iron plays a role in the production and maturation of a red blood cell. So what happens when the patient is iron deficient, um, it causes the red blood cells that do mature to be small. That term is microcytic, um, and so that's why it can at times be under the umbrella term of a microcytic anemia. Folic acid anemia is typically related to um, a poor um, dietary intake of folic acid, which is typically like your vitamin C supplements, your vitamin C rich foods. Um, it's typically related to a dietary deficiency that can be secondary to an alcoholism at times. It could also be um, related to certain medications. There are some oral contraceptives, some anti-epileptic drugs, um, methotrexate could also decrease the, sub, the absorption of folic acid. So um, pretty common anemia as well and typically can be treated effectively with just increasing the dietary intake of folic acid. The patients um, have who have this, the folic acid again as a piece of how it plays a part in the production and maturation of a normal functioning red blood cell and that's why the folic acid, um, the deficiency can cause an anemia. B12 anemia is also <clears throat> typically related to a dietary, a poor dietary intake. Some kind of, uh, you know, usually it's some kind of an <clears throat> issue with, you know, somebody that's on a poor diet. It could be somebody who has other comorbidities that causes them to not have a sufficient amount of intake. So B12 and folic acid work together to help with the production and maturation of a normal red blood cell. Um, vitamin B12 is used to activate the enzyme that moves folic acid into the precursor red blood cells so that they divide and function accurately. So B12 and vitamin and folic acid work together to make a normal red blood cell. So they are required um, to make sure that we have enough red blood cells. Um, these types of anemias are typically referred to a megoblastic or a macrocytic anemia because what happens when there's a deficiency in folic acid and B12, um, the, the red blood cells mature and, and are a weird, large, abnormal shape. So that's why um, they might be under the umbrella term of a macrocytic anemia. You might see that somewhere. Um, B12 deficiency is typically used related to patients who are on a vegan diet. Um, they don't drink dairy. Maybe that's somebody who's lactose intolerant. Patients who have had bowel surgeries, like part of their bowel remove, um, they may not be able to absorb as well. There is a different type of anemia that's um, referred to as a pernicious anemia. Um, there is a factor, an intrinsic factor, that is normally secreted by the gastric mucosa that is required for the intestinal absorption of B12. If someone is missing the intrinsic factor, it could be just because they were born um, without enough intrinsic factor. It could be because they've had a surgery to where it has um, decreased the amount of intrinsic factor secreted, um, they will not be able to absorb B12. So again, there's, there's, a, there's two types of B12. There's a type that's usually just diet, and then there's a pernicious anemia that is related to a decrease in the intrinsic factor. I'm not gonna have enough room to write this a decrease in the amount of intrinsic factor. Both of them are B12 deficiencies. Here's the big thing about this. If somebody just has a diet deficient in B12, we can increase the B12. They can 
um, that can, you know, if they just do increase the B12 supplements in their diet, then they're good to go. But if somebody has a pernicious anemia, the diet doesn't help them. You can give them as much B12 as you want, but if they don't have the intrinsic factor, they're, they're not going to absorb it. So treatment for pernicious anemia would be that they're going to have to get B12 injections. So that means we're going to inject it instead of give it to them PO. Because if we give it to them PO, they won't absorb it. We have to give them injections. So basically when somebody's diagnosed with a vitamin B12 deficiency, you have to determine the exact type of B12 deficiency that they have in order to treat it appropriately. Signs and symptoms of B12 deficiency. Um, of course, they'll have the typical anemic um, signs and symptoms such as fatigue, shortness of breath, things like that. They also might have this glossitis, which causes their tongue to be beefy red. And they can have um, poor balance. Um, sometimes it's just the, the nervous system effects from the decrease in the amount of functioning red blood cells. Aplastic anemia is a little bit different than the other ones that we just talked about. And aplastic anemia is referring to the fact that there's a deficient amount of circulating red blood cells coming from the bone marrow. It's typically because of the failure of the bone marrow to produce enough cells. It's caused by an injury in the immature precursor cell for the red blood cells. Sometimes it just occurs alone, and sometimes it just occurs, it can occur with um, a pancytopenia. Um, because there's some kind of a disease of the, the bone marrow that's not producing enough of these cells. So they're different. This kind of anemia is different. So typically what happens is somebody has a low red blood cell count. So we begin to start looking at their history, looking at their risk factors to try to determine the source of the red blood, the, of the anemia. It goes back to where we said that anemia is typically not a disease in itself. It's usually the result of another disorder. So we have to find out what is causing the decrease in the amount of red blood cells. In this case, we might um, pull the patient in, talk to them about their history. Um, if it's somebody who doesn't have any risk factors for things such as B12 deficiency, iron deficiency, um, then, or folic acid deficiency, then we would start to look to see if perhaps it's a problem with the production of the cells. We would also go ahead and check their B12 levels, their iron levels. Um, if all those are normal, then we're going to suspect that it has something to do with the production, not just the supplements. Sometimes the depression of the bone marrow to produce enough circulating cells is brought on by exposure to toxic agents, um, radiation, or some kind of an infection. Um, some kind of virus or something could have affected the bone marrow. This is a little bit harder to treat, as you can um, imagine, because now we've got a disease of the, the producing um, bone marrow. We've got to figure out how to... Um, make sure the patient uh, can produce some more red, healthy red blood cells. Of course, they could be, have blood transfusions, which would give them a supplemental um, of some mature good red blood cells. However, that is typically um, short term, and we're going to have to try to fix them long term. Um, we can give them a stem cell transplant which actually introduces um, some stem cells, which are baby cells, in the hopes that they'll take hold and that um, the patient can start to produce uh, some healthy red blood cells. Another thing, there are some medications that we can give the patient. Um, erythropoietin is one of them. Um, there are some drugs that we can give in order to stimulate the production of um, red blood cells. You have some drugs listed on your module outline um, that are defined as, as a supportive medications for the hematologic system. Again, like I said, erythropoietin is one of them. Procrit is another one of them. Um, so those, are, those drugs are designed to help with the production, that's supposed to stimulate the production of a red blood cell. There are some disorders of the hematologic system that are actually in excess of red blood cells in the circulating um, circulation. 
Um, what happens when this occurs, the red blood cells are greater than normal and it can make the blood very, very viscous or very, very thick, which can cause problems with circulation. So the blood tends to clot. The patient would look pretty much the opposite of what they would look like when they're anemic. They're gonna be red and flushed um, and have a higher blood pressure. They could be flushed, distended veins, itching can cause be caused by the dilated blood vessels. Um, the thick blood moves more slowly and puts more demands on the heart. So it's got more f volume in the body for the, the heart to pump. Again, that causes high blood pressure. This typically is caused by a type of cancer of the red blood cells has three major ha major hallmarks, massive production of red blood cells. They also make excessive leukocyte production and excessive production of platelets. This is called polycythemia vera. Um, it's, a, it's actually kind of a difficult prognosis and, and hard to treat. It's a chronic condition. It is a malignant cancer and it can progress in severity over time. Um, lifespan, if not treated, is two years after diagnosis, if not treated appropriately. A um, couple of things they can do, there's something called apheresis is where they can actually withdraw the blood and um, remove some of the blood components. So they sort of, they filter it out. This is similar to like a, a, a dialysis treatment. Um, then they return the blood to the patient after they filtered some of the excessive cells out. This can, um, you know, help be, treat them for a while. It is very expensive, um, and the patient would have to get frequent treatments, such as with a dialysis treatment. Um, treatment, other treatment can be to use anticoagulants to keep the blood thin. Those are things like heparin and Lovenox and Coumadin. Um, those are drugs that we would give. There's also a treatment listed. There's a table in your book for um, patient and family education for polycythemia vera. Um, and this is the one here that we're talking about. Um, they need to increase their fluids. That way that'll thin out their blood. Um, make sure they follow up with their healthcare provider. Take their anticoagulants as prescribed. Elevate their feet. Um, Stop activity if they have any kind of chest pain. Use an electric shaver that way they, since they have an increased number of platelets. Um, soft bristled toothbrush, things like that. Myelodysplastic um, syndromes are another type of malignant disorder. Um, it's caused by the formation of abnormal cells in the bone marrow. Another, again, this is a bone marrow problem. Um, and usually they're destroyed after they're released into the blood. So basically what happens is there's just an abnormal production of the cells and the patient ends up without adequate amounts of circulating healthy white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. Typically, this does occur um, older age people, over 60 usually. Um, it does have cancer-like features. Not really sure the cause, but it does um, tend to, uh, the risk does increase as the age patient ages. Sometimes it could be associated with some chemical exposures. Stem cell transplant is uh, the only thing that could be a treatment um, effectively for this patient. And we'll talk about that a little bit, what it means to do a stem cell transplant on a patient. Okay, now we're just going to move into um, disorders of the white blood cells. Um, leukemia is a cancer and typically is related to uncontrolled production of immature white blood cells. Those immature white blood cells are also referred to as blast cells in the bone marrow. That just means the stem cells, basically. Um, as the bone marrow typically becomes overcrowded with a bunch of immature white blood cells and is unable to produce functional, mature white blood cells. Um, leukemia, there's lots of different kinds of it, but essentially they cause the same problem. A bunch of immature white blood cells and no not enough 
mature functioning ones. Um, it can be acute or chronic. They're also, the leukemias are also named after the cells that cause the leukemia. So like a um, acute myelotic, myelogenous leukemia is from the myeloid pathways, um, the, the types of cells, that's where they originate from. So that's just for the reason for the different names. They typically cause very similar signs and symptoms in your patient and they typically um, require the same patient care. Um, just depends on their age. Um, it's important to remember that the production, um, the abnormal increase in the amount of um, mature, immature white blood cells that are found in the bone marrow can actually decrease the production of your red blood cells and platelets as well. So it can cause other problems for your patient um, because of that as well. And just think about typically, you know how to take care of a patient with leukemia. You know what um, a decreased amount of white blood cells means. That means they have a decreased immune system. So you have to do all those nursing interventions for a patient with a decreased immune system. They have a decreased amount of red blood cells due to the overcrowding in the bone marrow that leads to the inability of the bone marrow to produce effectively enough red blood cells as well, then you have to go ahead and uh, make sure you monitor that patient for any signs of anemia, fatigue, um, low blood pressure, high heart rate, things like that. Again, the platelets will be affected, which would mean if you had a low platelet count, your patient is at risk for bleeding. So you'll have to monitor your patient for signs and symptoms of bleeding and make sure you're doing interventions to protect them in case they would fall or be hurt. You want to try to prevent that because they would, um, they could bleed very um, too much with not enough platelets in their circulating system. There is a table in your um, in your book that just um, classifies the leukemia types. If you're curious, um, you know it's pretty. Pretty self-explanatory. If it's acute, it ha the onset is quicker. If it's chronic, it's a longer um, onset. Typically, um, occurs most often after the age of 50. More of the chronic ones are usually in adults. Signs and symptoms. Um, you know, a patient could come in with a d compromised immune system. You do some labs and you find that all their their cells are low. So. Um, you might suspect a leukemia. You know, if somebody's having um, symptoms of anemia, bleeding, uh, decreased immune system, we might suspect a leukemia, and that's kind of how it's typically diagnosed. These patients also may require a bone marrow biopsy and aspiration in order to make a definitive diagnosis. So again, you have to have, provide the nursing care for that situation. Infection is a major concern in patients with leukemia because they are so immunocompromised. Um, a nurse's job is to really make sure that we go, go above and beyond to protect them against infections. Um, that's making sure that they don't have any fresh flowers in their room, make sure nobody sick is able to go in their room, um, different things like that. Chemotherapy is a possible treatment for leukemia, so that could also um, increase their factors for um, infection. So um, a lot of nursing care is directed at protecting the patient from getting um, a infection that they don't have the ability to fight against since they are so immunocompromised and don't have the white blood cells like um, a normal person would. Chemotherapy for a leukemia typically um, consists of an induction therapy, which is an intense um, combination chemotherapy that they start right away in order to achieve a rapid, complete remission of all the manifestations of the disease. They typically try to suppress the bone marrow completely. Um, in order to uh, to kill all the the cancerous cells.
these patients are typically hospitalized for this amount of time, and there's usually a long hospitalization period for these patients. Um, a lot of side effects of the chemotherapy um, that we'll be on the lookout for, and also they'll have um, complete bone marrow suppression, so we'll watch for the um, recovery um, of the bone marrow. So we'll be have to protect them. There's also a consolidation therapy, which is another course of the same drugs, um, used in a little bit different combination. It usually occurs in early remission, so it's kind of like a maintenance therapy. What that happens next, maintenance therapy may be prescribed for months to years afterwards uh, to just make sure that we are treating the patient. So basically we come in um, really hard, really strong with some meds, and then we kind of um, kind of back off a little bit and give them some maintenance meds. And that's usually for your acute, acute leukemias. Another treatment that would be an option is something called a bone marrow transplant. Um, and that they have to find a donor. So basically what they do is um, they, they transplant someone else's bone marrow that's a, a matched donor and hopefully that normal bone marrow will, after we suppress the sick bone marrow, we can enter some healthy bone marrow that is um, a closely matched donor and that bone marrow will take over and from thereafter um, make normal red blood cells, sorry, white blood cells for that patient. Um, this is, can also be a treatment for um, lymphoma or aplastic anemia as well. It's important to understand how this process occurs. First of all, you do have to get a matching donor. Um, it's a little bit of a risky procedure because what they have to do um, is beyond even the induction therapy, they have to give patient additional chemotherapy. And the goal of this is that they completely knock out the patient's natural bone marrow. They have to get it completely free of the cancerous cells, um, which is a little bit risky because um, it has to be, it has to be followed by a stem cell transplant that actually takes, because if not, we've completely wiped out their bone marrow and the patient could actually die. This is actually called conditioning or cleaning the patient of their leukemic cells. And then after the conditioning, new healthy stem cells are given to the patient. Hopefully the stem cells go to the marrow and begin to produce um, normal functioning cells. Um, and hopefully that occurs. Sometimes it could fail. So um, it's, very, it's a very um, nervous, nerve wracking couple of days um, between conditioning and the implantation. The stem cells from the donor is actually aspirated from the bone marrow. When it's um, given to the patient, the receiver, it's actually like a transfusion. It's sort of like a blood transfusion. It is um, transfused into their circulating system. So it's taken out of the donor's bone marrow and then transfused to the receiver via an IV. This retrieval of the bone marrow occurs in the operating room Typically about 500 to 1,000 milliliters of marrow is aspirated, so it's a little bit um, uncomfortable um, and painful procedure for the donor. Um, so it's great when people are willing to do this. Um, so you could be in the um, given the task of taking care of the donor. So you're just going to monitor them for any complications such as pain, fluid loss, um, make sure they're hydrated. They typically need to stay in the hospital for a day. They may need a blood transfusion, it's just kind of monitoring them to make sure they recover from this donation. The process for the patient receiving bone marrow transplant is called the conditioning regimen. Review that in your book, it's kind of interesting. Um, it varies with each patient, but typically um, the first thing is to wipe out the patient's own bone marrow um, in, in order to give them the donor.
So they typically, in order to wipe them out, they give them a high, high dose of chemo, um, which can put them at risk for uh, lots of complications. They will then transplant. It's usually frozen marrow, packed red blood cells um, are given to the patient. They could have a fever or high blood pressure in response to the transplant, but it's the nurse's um, job to monitor for this. The term for a successful take of the transplanted cells is called engraftment. Engraftment means that the, the transplanted cells circulate in the peripheral blood for a brief period of time and then they begin to find their way into the bone marrow sites and establish itself there. That's called engraftment and that's what we want to happen. We want it to take. This process can take up to 21 days and so the patient will be monitored closely to ensure that this occurs. Um, when it does occur, their white blood cell, red blood cell, and platelets counts will begin to rise. Um, there's something called engraftment syndrome. It can cause a fever and weight gain. could occur at that time, so it's just something to monitor the patient for. They're going to be monitored closely, and it's going to be a very nerve-wracking situation for the patient to make sure that it actually occurs. So this is a difficult time for everybody. Um, infection can occur. Bleeding can occur. Um, Failure to engraft can occur. It's discussed in advance with the patient and donor. Um, failure to engraft occurs often with transplants. Um, if it fails to engraft, the patient could die. So it's kind of a risky little procedure. The patient can have a, um, a response to the, to the transplant, just like you could have a, a response to a blood transfusion, it's called graft versus host disease, where the, the body recognizes it as something that is born and tries to fight against it. Um, so this could be a poor outcome as well. It's important that you monitor and read in your book as far as um, what a stem cell transplant means and uh, what the steps are for a nurse to help take care of a patient with that procedure. Okay, we're going to move on and talk about lymphomas. Lymphomas are cancers of the lymphoid tissue. Um, it's typically an abnormal growth of the lymphocytes. If you recall, lymphocytes are a type of white blood cell. So again, it leads to a compromise of the immune system when someone has a lymphoma. Uh, lymphomas are differentiated into um, a Hodgkin's lymphoma and a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. What differentiates um, a Hodgkin's lymphoma is a specific type of cancer cell. It's called the Reed Sternberg cell. It's a marker for Hodgkin's lymphoma. So it's a cancer that starts in the lymph um, node or a single chain of lymph nodes. And when they test this, it is positive for a Reed Sternberg cell, and that's what makes it um, a Hodgkin's lymphoma. This can occur at any age, however, it does tend to appear in people between the ages um, in their teen and adult, young adult, and then it also can peak in people ages 50 to 60, so there's like two areas that it actually tends to be more prevalent in. It is more prevalent in men in the older age group. Signs and symptoms of a Hodgkin's lymphoma is typically um, they will find a lymph node that is painless. It might be enlarged, but it's painless. Um, they might have unexplained weight loss, night sweats. Um, this means that uh, they might have a poor prognosis if they have all these manifestations. Hodgkin's lymphoma is one of the most treatable types of cancer um, for stages one and two of the disease. Um, it's typically some radiation of those lymph nodes. More extensive, um, if it's more of a stage four, they might have a combo of radiation and chemotherapy. Again, uh, taking care of this patient would be to educate them about their treatment, their diagnosis, and support them through their type of treatment. If it's radiation, you know how to take care of a patient with radiation now. If it's radiation and chemotherapy, just review what you would need to know to teach them regarding that treatment.
Moving on to a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is a diagnosis that includes all of the lymphoid cancers that do not have the Reed-Sternberg cell. So the Reed-Sternberg cell is the thing that differentiates a lymphoma from being a Hodgkin's and a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. There are many different subclasses of a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, we don't really know the causes of, of um, any of them. However, it is thought to be um, related to some risk factors such as immunosuppressive therapy, HIV, chronic helobacter pylori infection, which we will talk about more um, in module five regarding the GI system. Again, um, some viruses such as the Epstein-Barr virus is thought to be a precursor for it. Um, there seems to be an increase in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma among people who are exposed to pesticides, insecticides, and dust. These patients will have swollen lymph nodes, which is also referred to as lymphadenopathy. More specifically, it's um, painless swelling of these. So they just might have um, a swelling of their cervical, axillary, inguinal, or femoral nodes. The diagnosis is made after biopsy of the, the swollen lymph node. The biopsy will differentiate what type of lymphoma um, it is. These are tricky to treat. They're a little bit, this absolutely requires an oncologist because there's, it has to be differentiated into the type of non-Hodgkin's. Um, and it's very much based on the type of tumor the treatment is. So um, very, very specific treatment here for lymphomas. It's typically a chemotherapy consists of um, the combination chemotherapies coupled with radiation as well. Prognosis is a little bit more poor with a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So if you were, you had to choose between a Hodgkin's and a non-Hodgkin's, you would want to pick Hodgkin's. It's much more treatable. Prognosis is greater with a Hodgkin's lymphoma. This is just a visual picture of the signs and symptoms of leukemia. The ANT um, is just an acronym that they came up with for the signs and symptoms of leukemia. You have an ANT, which is anemia, anemia neutropenia, which means a low white blood cell count, and thrombocytopenia. Um, so they have numerous immature white blood cells like the ants in an ant colony. Just a little visual to help you remember what happens to the body. This concludes the presentation on care of the patient with a hematologic problem.